Conan show. Shows show is uh, doing a, a retake of our earlier Conan show today, uh, with you know a, a seemingly a plethora of technical issues, and uh, my guest Sam Thrift, and of course thank you Paula Gloria for teching for us and teaching us, and. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been talking, uh, you know, you were, you were just on Joe's show um, talking about um, the vote, what happened, and the percentages and stuff. And uh, you, you explored some ideas about how we could make things better as, mm. a, as, a, as a unified people. And, you know, one of the things I was thinking, you know, when I was running the other camera there when you guys were talking, as, uh, do you ever you ever listen to or watch any of the David Icke videos? No. no. All right, David Icke is a, a broadcaster who used to be a, f a well-known footballer, which is rugby, you know, but in, in, in the UK. Got it. And uh, after his professional career as an uh, athlete, he, he became a, a sports broadcaster, hmm. uh, much like they do in this country, right? And in his experience doing that, Various people from different walks of life started bringing him really weird information. Huh. Really weird. And one of them was, uh, or a number of them, were staffers for the uh, palace. Okay. At um, the in famous London. in London, yeah, the famous famous palace. What is that? Buckingham. Buckingham Palace. Thank you. Little, little, forgot that for a second thing. Um, so these staffers uh, uh, were saying to to David, you know, uh, things are pretty creepy over there at the palace. Mm. And they were talking about ritual killings and you know shape shifting lizards as the Queen of England, and that they need to consume human blood and flesh to stay in a human form. Mm. This is the kind of things that he was hearing, and uh, this was quite alarming to him. But he and but over over the years, these kinds of reports kept coming, but from other places, you mm -hmm. know, uh, um, people who were um, servicing or or uh, working for um, heads of state and, and you know like very high level politicians and this sort of thing. And he started hearing the same kind of things going on, and you know, and then he heard about human trafficking, and he, and so he started to research this stuff. And uh, it became a mission. So, mm -hmm. so David Ike has done a, an in-depth study on the banking families, the banking uh, paradigm, yeah. the control paradigm that we all live under, mm -hmm. you know, wage slavery or slave wagery, mm -hmm. um, and the psychological power tools that are used. Right. They um, are. It's magic. Now what he calls, he calls it problem, reaction, solution. Hmm. All right. And in this scenario, problem, reaction, solution, you have an agenda as a controlling uh, power broker, right. right? Player, as a player, right? And in this agenda, uh, say for example, you want to disarm America, mm. right? Because having, you know, 100 million households with weapons and ammunition um, and educated with free speech on the internet and on public TV and whatever, you know, public access, you know, people spread ideas, and perhaps maybe we need to take their guns away because we want to take their rights away. Right. So, so they create a problem. The problem is um, lone gunmen, you know, students who are bullied at school and have been eating too much Prozac. Mm. And they bring guns to school, and they shoot up a bunch of kids, and boy, isn't that terrible. We need gun control. Right. All right, so then it's interesting that we've had so many of these scenarios, whether it's Columbine or, or the West Virginia um, thing or the, the movie theater and 
um, I think I was uh, California, I think. Right. Um, you know, all these mass shootings. Yep. And we, they're still trying to take our, our guns away, you know, but they haven't been able to do it. They're getting a lot of resistance, and so it becomes more and more obvious. But the reaction part is, is they get the public to react. Mm. And what's the, 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 the reaction that is desired is, take the guns away. Can I jump in on one thing on this? Go ahead. They found, they found that almost all the people that have done these shootings were on psychoactive drugs that yes. psychiatrists were giving them. Yes. You yes. know? And I also think that they're programming, they're giving them these drugs, right. turning them into hypnotic zombies, yes, sir. and programming them to do that just so that they can use that as an excuse to say, take the guns away from all the American people. That was the thing I just wanted to add. Oh, yeah, they no, all were on psycho yeah. psychotropic drugs. Almost, yep. almost every one of them, if not every one of them. Yeah. And they call that problem, reaction, solution. So, so they, 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 have, they have all of these, you know, the, the, the public then has outrage, right? right? And it reacts and it demands a solution. And by golly, gosh, guess what? Here's the solution: gun control. Right. You know they've had they have it waiting in the wings. Of course. Right. And um, well, that's good economics too. You 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 get somebody to you make a problem and then you give the solution. You create the problem and then you provide the solution. But all along the solution was your agenda. Yeah. That is exactly that's exactly the game. Right. So uh, that's exactly that's right. that's one of the uh, power tools yeah. that that the our our controllers use on and that's what i mean by communicating like like spells right back in the day spell where did, spell came from spelling people were illiterate spells were spell was the spell and then magic like bards like you make a song about somebody songs are very powerful and they're used in jingles all the time and songs will bring moods to your thoughts so it's all and it's all trickery and it's very interesting because when you start studying how these things work, just like what you're talking about, then you see the motive behind it. What I say is follow the slug trail of greed <laughs> and all your answers because they leave trails. They do. They following do. them of their agendas. Go ahead. Sorry. One of, one of the uh, ancient Irish bits of um, magic, mm. right, is that in... in, in certain alchemical style thinking, right, that is that, you know, we can make agreements with matter around us. Mm. You know, the table is wood, you know, the legs may be metal, iron, you know, so you have the wood, the iron, you got the stone on the floor, you know, all of these elements have personality. Mm. This is a very African thought too, mm. and Native American. It's a, it, ancient traditional cosmic thought is that uh, our our reality mm. is constructed with agreements like almost like contracts right and how they would make a new agreement with their reality the the, the shamans of, of ancient Ireland is through enchantment mm. they would they would be enchanting their Glade or their wood or their their home mm. with a song, and that's that's where enchantment comes from is chanting. Mm. Mm. So so like somebody that. who's you know enchanting is that that implies they're kind of magical, right? Yeah. But it comes from making new agreements with your reality by singing. I like that. Right. And, and the power of the words have a lot to do with what it is that the agreement you're trying to make. You know, like they a, proved that. A, 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 a traditional chant from um, Ireland, but I don't know the Gaelic, so it's, it's, mm. it's, it's been translated to English from okay. Gaelic, right? It goes, um, the rocks, the stones, and the crystals, hey young, hey younger, hey young. The rocks, the stones, and the crystals. Mm. Hey young, hey younger, hey young. The power of the earth 
the power of the earth, the power of the earth, the power of the earth, the rocks, the stones, and the crystals. Mm. Hey, young, hey, young, hey, young. All right, so that's the chant. Got it. Right? And, and this is kind of an earth chant. I like it. So you're, so you're, you're making a relationship, an agreement with the rocks, the stones, and the crystals, mm. and the power of the earth. Mm. Right? You're making a relationship with them by singing to them. I don't know if that's the right word because I don't really, you know, it's, it, I think it was, I, mean, I got it from a man, a, 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 an internationally known um, dowser, a very, very well-known dowser by the name of Sig Lundgren. And, and, you know, he said that this chant was, it's an honoring. It's a, it's. Right. I think I think it's also a prayer, in yeah. sense. I mean, a spiritual person. I mean, some of these words have become kind of like bad words in some people's minds because they assimilate it to other things. But prayer is very good. I think all cultures, all indigenous peoples chanted. That to me is prayer. You're praying to everything. You're thanking it for what it is. And I think that you know we're not taught this stuff in school. So people would, would say, um, wow, that's really out of the box, but this is, this is actually very valid because they did a study, this Japanese study, about the emotions of water, and they studied how different beakers of water, it's a book, it's really compelling, and it changed my life because they did a study of the what... H hidden Messages of Water yes. by Dr. Emoto. Yeah. Yeah. And I say, if I'm 80%, 75% water, if this planet is 75% water, then what effects do I have on my own mind, let alone what other people are bringing in? So I have all these like negative connotations in here. So what if, what if my healing would be meditation, prayer to myself, and so I came up with my own chant as being a, something that I have to come to terms with? And it's cleansing, healing, renewing through and through, so beautiful and true. It does as it's intended to, such a spectacle, incomprehensible to people who only know the tangible, confused without a clue. And I'll repeat this. And when I'm bar bombarded with negative thoughts, you know, they would want to put me on like antidepressants and stuff as a child because I found my best friend dead, so why not drug the kid up, you know? But uh, I found my best friend dead when I was 16 in the, in the woods and with his mother in the middle of the night, and that's when I actually, uh, the ambulance guy gave me cigarettes. I never wanted to smoke before that, but I was given the drug. I was told, you know, you have a problem now. Take all these pills. They weren't my solution. I realized that a way for me to contradict all these negative feelings was to come up with a chant, just like you're saying. Mm -hmm. A simple chant freed me from the negative thought cycles. And that's exactly what they are. They're negative cycles. I don't, you know, history repeats itself. How do you break the negative cycle? You replace the negative cycle with a positive one. And I think what you're saying has such validity and it doesn't get heard. People don't often speak about it. And it it's really compelling information. And if you just link the science with what's always been that for thousands of years, so then what other things are ancient that, that are communal, that, that we're kind of stripped from in this society. The communal singing, the chanting, the communal part of that too, um, I think. Yeah, yeah. becoming, becoming uh, of one mind, one uh, heart, and one law mm. is, is uh, like the, from the Northeast Woodlands peoples here, right? Like the, the Haudenosaunee. Right, the Five mm. Nation Confederacy. Mm. One mind, one heart, one law. Nice. And and that's cosmic law. It's natural law. Yeah. And everything is governed by that cosmic law. And when you violate cosmic law, then you have repercussions, yeah. consequences. As, as as does any kind of law. Ignorance you know? of the law is no excuse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if if you dam a river improperly or without 
the respect mm. of your environment, and then, um, and then you have uh, an un unpredictable weather event, you know, where a 500-year flood comes along, and the villages downstream get wiped out from the dam bursting or, or being over overrun. You know this kind of thing. There are consequences to to everything that we do, yes, sir. which is which is you know almost um, unbelievable to me that we don't suffer much worse as a world civilization with all the bad things that are being done to our planet and to each other as, as a species. Mm. Right? Um, you know, case in point, just. Why isn't there more car accidents on the New Jersey Turnpike or in New, New York City? You know, some of the best drivers in the world are from New York City because it's just such an intense, is. chaotic experience. I mean, it is. You, you, you have to be on your toes. You can't oh, yeah. be a lazadaisical driver oh, in New no. York. You know, you have to no be way. an aggressive driver. Yes, sir. A passive driver will, will get in trouble very quickly, oh, whereas, yeah. you, you, know, you know, it's time to punch the gas, punch the gas. But, you know, I, I often think that, you know, what a benevolent planet, because I, I ascribe to the idea that the planet itself is a living thing mm -hmm. and that we are part of a greater whole and that, you know, on the drama on our planet of, of our growth experiences, whatever it is that we need to do to, to grow mm. um, and the conflicts that arise and come and go, you know, all of this that's taking place, you know, and there's like nuclear bombs going off, and there's satellites going up in the at, you know, and there's, there's radio you know, waves flying, civil, civil wars going on. Yeah. There's you know, terrible, terrible things happening. Um, and in spite of all of that, strip mining, you know, all, all the you know. Uh, Offshore, off, offshore drilling, you know, the, yeah. the terror, you know, the, the big fishing, the planet supports us, right? In in almost in defiance of our hubris, <laughs> the planet is supporting us. I like the way you said that. And to me, it's it's a huge expression of love. Yeah. And you know. I, I used to be a kind of a fellow that just thought, you know what, if we just got rid of all the humans, everything would be fine. And, you know, I changed my view on that relatively l recently, you know, in the last 15 years mm. or, or 20 years. And, and I, I swung all the way around to humans are wonderful. You know, we are amazing. <laughs> We're an incredible species. We have such capability. Oh yeah, and that there's room for everybody, you know, and more. And more. You know, there, there's room for 20 billion. There's room for 30 billion human beings, you know. But, nothing, but there's but there's not, not, not but there's not room for 20 billion automobiles or 20 billion yeah. factories or 20 Cities. billion. You know, huge cities. Well, c cities don't have to be bad either. No, no they that's don't. A, that's another thing. And, and one of my favorite, you know, hot button topics to bother people with is, you know, the whole climate change fraud that that I call it fraud. Uh -huh. right? You know, the, the, what it was was it was called global warming, and it was called global warming uh, because they were very good at making it get warm. Uh -huh. And you know what challenges a lot of people is the idea that we are dealing with today with very exotic technologies and a lot of them. But my my focus in the past ten years became chemtrails, condensation right. trails. You know, are one thing. You know, um, do, doing a little you know quick course on on chemistry for folks uh, when you drive your car or are in a jet airplane and the fuel of choice happens to be a petroleum deri derivative, gasoline or diesel fuel, 
kerosene. That's what jet fuel is, by the way. Jet fuel is kerosene. That's, that's all it really is. And you have this compound, you know, gasoline, that is very rich in hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. which is carbons with a bunch of hydrogen connected to it. Right. Right? So it gets, you know, slurped up by your engine through a carburetor or through a fuel injector, mm -hmm. and then air with lots of oxygen mm -hmm. gets, you know, compressed mm -hmm. into the engine, and then it is ignited with a spark, and then what happens is, is the oxygen is um, liberated, right. liberated from, from the air and, and attaches to the hydrogen, right. which is liberated from the carbon. Okay. Right? And then you have a boom, uh -huh. right? It throws the piston, yeah. a valve opens, it gets, goes into the exhaust pipe, and what comes out is steam, water. So the, I'm not sure what the ratio is, what the formula is, but for every gallon of gasoline you burn, mm -hmm. you're putting out almost a gallon of water, or a half a gallon of water, because there are other there are other phenomena that goes on with the with, you know the carbon comes out as ash, a little bit of that. And if there's other particulates in there, sulfur or whatever, that'll come out in some fashion, but by and large. It's water. Mm -hmm. That's what's coming out of the tailpipe, mostly water. And, and then, you know, um, up in the sky, you know, the jet aircraft, you got sort of the same thing going on. They're burning kerosene. The kerosene's a hydrocarbon. It's getting compounded with, with oxygen. It's getting lit. It comes out as steam. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes ice crystals, and that's the white trail. Mm -hmm. But the long, long trails that can be turned on and turned off and turned on and turned off, and then they come out and they spread out. These they, they become like artificial cloud depths, yep. right? And as you know, I researched and, and, and looked into that. It, it, it became evident to me, and from my own ground observations, that these low artificial clouds trap heat. Right. Now, you were the first person to ever even mention this to me when we were neighbors. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is kind of weird. I never really thought of that. But I had always watched the sky. Right. So ever since you mentioned this to me. You start watching. I started watching. I said, man, you know, I'm not the type of person so did you to see any, disregard did you, people. Did, did you see any weird stuff? I'd say, honestly, at this point, I have chemtrail examples in my cell phone. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like it's very interesting because then I researched a little deeper and I found out about HARP and I found out about these chemtrails being a uh, uh, approach to attack, you know, climate change. But also I thought about this even deeper and I said, what's a real good use for this? Anti-surveillance. Why, why would you want to be able to summon up a cloud instantaneously? Not only for what you're saying, and I could understand that, but also you have sat governments of the world using satellites. Wouldn't you want to be able to summon up cloud cover to pre prevent them from seeing you do your moves? Well, there's so that. There's, um, there's that. In, in, I mean, that in, world, in world War II, that was what <clears throat> it was. You know, chemtrails were used extensively in the bombing raids. Well, there you go. I didn't know that. And, and that, was, that, was to, that was to keep the planes from being shot down. Wow. I believe they're spraying us like bugs. That's, uh, uh, yeah. That too. Absolutely. Yeah, that, what, I, what I, I, I call it like, you know, cans of raid marked humans, you know, were flying overhead. And the compounds that are being measured by a lot of, uh, a lot of people, who, activists who, who take ground samples uh, of, of uh, rain that has come through, you know, clearly, you know, mm. toxic clouds. We'll find that there's a lot, a high, an elevated amounts of uh, aluminum oxide and barium, and, uh, right? barium um, and a few other choice heavy metals. Uh, and but the the metals themselves also apply to the HARP program, mm -hmm. right? Because now not only are, are these artificial clouds and they're laden with metal particulates, but if you hit them with the right frequencies, yes, sir. you can move them around right. and heat them up and, yep. and, and make and them do your bidding. Do do various other yeah. clever things to to our yeah. 
population. So, so I was thinking, I'm like, okay, so you, a you have a good you have a good defensive weapon, so that makes sense. How do you sell this, right? Climate change. You, you say, but but then I say, okay, you know, maybe there is some validity to climate change. Let me research that too, and not be so. My wife and I went to the Museum of the Earth over at Cornell. And I actually gained a little, you know, a little confidence by, by seeing that because this is being pushed like we're all going to die. This is terrible. Look what we're doing. But the Earth has actually been through ice ages five different times, and a lot of these temperatures are nowhere near what we're seeing now. Yeah, in our in our span, yeah, they're increasing. But in the overall span, these are this is an actual natural cycle. The Earth has done five different times, and I do agree with you. That you know, a lot of this is is calculated. I do. I really believe that you know, harp is an instrument. They sell. They fit the bill through climate change. It's just like anything else. And then they they say, oh, this is our reason. But then they have their own agenda. Once again, I, yeah, I really do. Yeah. It's not just Earth that's overheating. They found that all the other planets, Jupiter, Mars, all those, they're getting hotter too. So it's not just the here what humans are doing. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, you know, I noticed. I noticed some. There's some validity to that too, because in the last five to six years, I definitely and I work outside a lot. I had noticed a definite increase in sun intensity. From my personal perspective, and I used to play outside all the time. I used to like love being outside, and I had fair skin, so I would burn if I was out for maybe two hours. You know. Three four hours without sunscreen, I would burn, and and in the recent more years, you know, the six to five year window, I could be out for a half an hour, and burn. So there, I mean, and even even in your car, you sense, and the babies dying in the cars from the you know, and the dogs dying in the cars. I think that that also has a link. Well, to they got to open intensity. the windows. <laughs> well, there's that, no doubt, George. There's that, but definitely increasing in sun intensity. I, I do believe. Well, the well the the past six years, up until about really two years ago, uh, was the end of a peak solar cycle. Mm. Where the the they call it TSI total solar um, irradiance had peaked, and it gave us some pretty powerful El Nino events. Uh, I think 1989 might have been a very powerful El Nino event. I think uh, 2013 was a pretty good one. I'm not sure um, on the dates on this kind of stuff. But the idea is is that you know. The peak of our global warming phenomenon was also in, in step with solar output. The solar output was very high. Now we've gone into literally off a cliff. This total solar irradiance is, has, has come down a notch. But more importantly is the sunspot count. Hmm. See now, now sunspots give us heat. When you have lots of sunspots, the sun is, a hot, is hotter and, and that heat is translatable in 17 seconds. Mm. You know, so so our sun earth connection is 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 very very immediate. I mean, we're 93 million miles from the sun. That's what they tell us. I don't mm -hmm. know how true that is, but that's what they tell us. And that sunspots are are very important because they chart them. Mm -hmm. And there's thousands of years of records with sunspot you, you know from uh, the Chinese, hmm. you know, have contributed to this this record of our sun. So there are things there are things called Milankovitch cycles, uh, and and these these cycles of, of high solar uh, output or high solar uh, storms, uh, which are sunspots that that then drop off um, a, in, into uh, um, dormant periods, and coincidentally. The sun spots drop off and go. The sun goes quiet, as they say, and fairly shortly after that, temperatures drop. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on the the solar cycle and the, and the period, because they, the, the periodicities um, have different. Um, uh, I don't Times. know the word time, time spans. Time right. Spans. So one periodicity is the one that's averages about eleven years. Okay. That's the one that we all know about, and the the, the and the full 
um, sine wave for that is actually 22 to 24 years. Mm. So, so you have the, the uh, solar cycle 24, for example, you know, or whichever solar cycle that we're, we're counting, mm -hmm. will be divided in half, and, and, and one will be the, the, the high part of the, of the curve, yeah. you know, where you have a, a maximum output, and then the other half of that solar cycle is, is the dip. Mm -hmm. right? so, so you have this lovely sine wave, and the sun is fairly regular mm -hmm. on that. But then you have, you know, like the, the Dalton minimum uh, or the, or the mod, modder minimum, which are minimum solar outputs that every 160,000 years just goes into a funk and doesn't come out. Hmm. And so, so this is the worry that the Russians are having, Russian solar scientists and a few uh, solar scientists over in, in um, Norway and, and surrounds, that part of the world, they, they're very concerned about solar cycles because civilizations are known to fail when you go into something like a Dalton or a modern minimum. Hmm. And but doesn't it affect all of us, not just Norway? Well, <laughs> they are particularly, Norway and Russia are particularly sensitive because they suffer winter, seriously suffer winter. And, you know, an average winter for them would be painful for us, but a hard winter for them would probably devastate us. Mm. But when, when they have, you know, something that's devastating to them, then you're talking about a global event. Yeah. Right? So that, that, that's one of, the, one of the things why they, they study the sun so much. The, 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 all of the, the great failures of Chinese dynasties were associated with solar minimums. Mm. And the concern with the, the Russian scientists, you know, like today, with the solar minimum that is now about one or two years into it, is that we're due for one of the big ones. So we could go, we could have the sun go quiet. Um, we could have the sun go quiet for 10 years, 30 years, 300 years. And if you're talking 300 years, then you're talking about the kind of winters that, that the Northern Hemisphere was having in the 1600s. Mm. You know, the, the, the River Thames in England would freeze over mm. regularly, you know. And then it's, it, it, the 1700s were notoriously snowy and cold here in the colonies, right? And then by the 1850s, things were really warming up. It was a very significant warm-up, and there was a, a, a huge volcanic eruption. It may have been Krakatoa mm -hmm. in the 1850s, 1860s, and it was the summer, the summer with the the, the the summer that didn't happen. You know, it was a famous. There was crop failures all across because it um, clouded the sky. It occluded the sun, and and you know, global temperatures you know, fell, you know, markedly, uh, I think for maybe two growing seasons and things, and things started recovering. That's what we could be looking at now is, is, is the solar minimum being of that order of magnitude where it could be 30 or 50 or, or 300 years mm -hmm. of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a dimming sun. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at the last year, it was all record highs. That's challengeable. It is. I. I. That's what did, I mean. Did though. you? Did I, I see? I. I don't. I cannot. You know. Believe locally. Yeah. That you, last year was a record hot year, or this summer was a record hot year, no. or even the one before that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying locally. I'm not. I'm not going to get into the global thing. That's why yet. I was going to go when I was down south in Florida. Yeah. And and this is why I left because. Their their solar days mm -hmm. they range from eight like usually it was like eight to twelve mm -hmm. on the UV scale, and some days with solar flares it would be in big bold letters thirteen right like super solar days and so I guess I mean and and then judging from that and then you know looking at the uh, the the cycles of the planet and the average earthly temperatures. Uh, that it went through in the Museum mm -hmm. of the Earth, it would dip into these ice age periods for long periods of time, but nowhere near as long as the heat ups. And 
it would dip down into these ice ages and then it would slowly increase. And it was my belief and my theory that in those dips is when intelligent species could have arisen over, you know, flourished. Like mm. a ton of different species could have flourished. A big boom of life like in the uh, um, different, different Jurassic periods and then a big die off. Yeah, well, those those things do happen. So I'm, these are natural cycles that the planet goes through, and I feel like I feel like uh, us as a as a species should talk about that. Yeah, we um, should be aware of them. Great article I, I mm. landed into about uh, eight months ago. Mm. Talks about and I, I think it was from the former one of the founders of Greenpeace. Okay, and he. he He's a biologist, and um, I can't pull up his name at the moment, but the gist of the article was all about um, trees. Okay. Trees in the ancient, ancient times, you know, when, when trees were ruling the earth. Right. And these trees were massive, and there hadn't been the development of fungi yet to break down the cellulose. So when these trees died and toppled over, more trees just grew on top of trees. And this, this went on for uh, something like, I don't know, 100 million years, mm -hmm. some incredible length of time. Mm -hmm. And all of that material eventually gets subsided into the earth, you know, and deposits from volcanoes, whatever, and got compressed and became coal seams. Okay. So, so this, is, this is where all of our coal came from. And the trees were huge, and this development was huge because the volcanism of the earlier Earth put so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere mm -hmm. that plants had this vigorous supply of carbon dioxide right. to ingest and make wood, you know, make, make material yeah. right, as they grow. And the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was much higher than oh, yeah. today. Oh yeah. You know, not, not, we're not like talking. No we're not talking 400 parts per million. No. We're not talking, you know, 800 parts per million. We're talking like 2,200 parts per million, right. or even more. Yeah. Right. And and there were there were. There was a thicker atmosphere, uh -huh. and there was more oxygen as well, because what the plants give off? Right. Once oxygen. The, once the plants took hold, yeah. And this this uh, development led to um, a condition of sequestering. Okay. So all this carbon dioxide that had been once upon a time very abundant, over the millions of years, coming up to the rise of humans, uh -huh. this became less and less right? because the plants sequestered it. it, they became coal, and now we're re-releasing that same carbon dioxide by burning the coal, um, which is a true fossil fuel, whereas petroleum oil is not necessarily a fossil fuel at all. Huh. Petroleum oil is an, an a abiotic, it's the minerals. Test, test, one, two. Could it be that I may have, maybe I stepped... Test, test, one, two. Check, check. Check, 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 one, two. Oh, okay. Check, check, check. Okay, so maybe that was me. I might have, I might have kicked the cord. All right. Um, so the interesting thing is that you know there, there's a great deal of hoopla about being you know more than uh, 400 parts per million. Yes. Right. That, that is the big dioxide. deal. That's right. right. Scientists big around deal. the world. Big, 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 big upset. Out. Okay. Real, real big problem. Terrible problem. Awful problem. The only problem is, is that we may have saved our planetary collective behinds by burning 
all this fossil fuel and all of these petroleum products in the past 200 years because our planetary atmospheric carbon dioxide had dropped to about 170, 180 parts per million. Mm. Plants start to starve and die at 150 parts per million. If it goes below 150 parts per million to 100 parts per million or something like that, then you're going to have these huge die-offs mm. of, the, of the plant matter, which would then not provide oxygen for the oxygen breathing animals. Right. And th this is this is an idea that when I present it to my my you know hardcore eco uh, friends, um, that that's they can't wrap their brains around the idea that carbon dioxide is a miracle gas that we need it. It's 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 essential to life mm. on this planet, and that due to the planet's own natural cycles, the carbon dioxide was, was, was being effectively removed from the atmosphere mm. by its own devices. But now here we've come along and reintroduced the carbon dioxide. And now, we're looking at a greening of the planet. Hmm. There are forests coming back in desert areas like the Sahara. Are there? There are. There are, there are new, new patterns of rain being established across the various continents. Um, the, Ata I'm the Atacama Desert, the driest, driest location on the planet this, this year, this year and I think last year as well, received rains rains that they hadn't seen in possibly a hundred years hmm. that made the Atacama Desert bloom. Um, another one is uh, deserts in Mongolia. The Gobi Desert got rain, hmm. lots of rain. Wow. And, and there's been rain events in Saudi Arabia. That's funny because we didn't get much rain in the Northeast here. It was dry this year. It was dry, but it, it hasn't been as dry as I remember now. And the other thing is, is I remember the 1990s up here. The yeah. 1990s were extremely dry and extremely hot. Yeah. And I didn't realize that the pollution in the sky I was looking at was engineered. Right. That's another another kind of aspect to this. Yeah. But you know, the Housatonic River over there in Connecticut, not far from here, mm -hmm. uh, that goes through the Shkatakoke Reserve, okay? In, in, the, in the late 1990s, 1998, 1997, you could walk across the river and not even get your ankles wet. Hmm. There were brooks and, and rivers between here and Connecticut, you know, going back and forth across the Hudson that were dried up. Grass was growing in the, in the, in the brooks. Wow. Right? That's how dry it was here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is, this is kind of shifted back into a more more normal uh, weather pattern um, but if you go go back further the records go back in the 1800s around this area you know it was not uncommon to have you know 30 35 feet of snow a year hmm. you know that's that's a lot of snow you know and and, and, and there there are people in living memory up on uh, the reserve up at Aquisasne north of the Adirondacks there who talked about snow up to the tops of the phone poles. Right. You know, and this was, this was the norm. So we're not getting that kind of snow. We're not getting that kind of water in our water tables um, because of these, you know, climate related changes. Mm -hmm. You know, whether those climate related changes are man made or not is, is subject you know, for scrutiny. I mean, right. uh, we don't know how much culpability our civilization has in these changes. I tend to think they have a lot of culpability, but not for this, not for the same reasons. Right. I think I think deforestation yep. has created deserts around the world. Absolutely. You know, uh, I think that. Um, I guess the reason why I brought up large cities before. Yeah, I wanted to get back to that. I was I was heading back. The to only that. reason why. Oh, did you want to finish the thought? Well, the thought with that is, is that one of the things, one of the benefits of, of say, like a New York City or mm. some cities like this, is that now you have, you know, 9, 12 million people 
living, you know, one one, 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 one high rise apartment building is the equivalent of 30 towns. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So you've, you've got uh, uh, all this land, you know, like our, our beautiful Catskills here mm -hmm. are, have more trees in them than they had 100 years ago. That's true. Because they had been all deforested, deforested yeah. for a variety of reasons. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, the large scale agriculture is feeding these millions of people in the big cities. Mm -hmm. And there, there's there's pluses and minuses with that as well. Absolutely. But the but the, you know the 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 greatest um, answer to some of these civilization scale problems was something that uh, transpired in India and Cuba in the 1970s because mm. these are rural places with lots of people mm. and they needed to grow food. Yeah. You know, but they had issues with mechanized equipment not being effective in swamp or year or mud or you know a variety of conditions that, that that India and places like Cuba have and so this guy got this great idea and he called it appropriate technology you know, and the idea behind appropriate technology is they redesigned the plows to be pulled by ox or water buffalo or draft animals of choice that of your of your region okay and this was a huge benefit in, in, in all of these rural areas that were having to grow the food for the big urban centers in mm. places like India. Right. You know, and then, and that's, that's kind of the one thing that really bothers me about our industrial age here in North mm. America is that we're not doing anything with draft animals. Everything's tractors, everything's mechanized. Yes, sir. And, and the family farm, you know, if you want to support the family farm, like I, 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 w I love the, the Woodstock uh, uh, farm festival, right? Where, you know, farmers are coming from as far away as New Pulse and stuff, and they're, you know, mm -hmm. getting their fresh, you know, organic and yada yada, good stuff. But it's, it's cost prohibitive for me. Right. So the small farm has to be, you know, Revolution. they really have to charge a lot, you know, to survive. And, and I don't it's begrudge true. them that. It's just that I don't make a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I guess absolutely I know what you're saying. I said, you know, I design homes now. Mm -hmm. I started doing architecture. I've been going to college for architecture. The whole thing that got me into drafting and architectural design is knowing that my home costs me money. But I can make a home that makes some electricity some hot water and some food. I can. I designed a few of them. They grow some food, they make their own hot water and their own electricity, and they last a long time. They don't have so many little nooks and crannies water can get into. I designed that with, it, with that in mind. They last a long time, they provide for you. And my problem with the city, um, as is, is that ocean levels are rising. And with these old structures, you're gonna have a rising sea level on a lot of these coastal cities. And my fear is, is the pollutants getting into the ocean even worse than it already is. My friend Matt lives in the city and he says that the wastewater, if they get a half inch of rain, they, they release all that waste right into the ocean. My problem with the city is not the city itself, it's the design, as is, unfortunately. And I think that the only way that we as a human species are gonna overcome this is if we become self-reliant individually to some degree more than we are. I'm not saying all your food is grown, but you can have more greenhouses. And then some food's grown in your house. And then you see your neighbor for the kale and you see your other neighbor for the strawberries and the, and the eggs. And until we can reach that level of affordability and barter, we can't really fix these old, old systems. And, and I think one of the other last thing that I want to add with the big city is when you have a large city like that with so little vegetation, cloud generation is significantly reduced, natural cloud generation, and, and, and heat ups happen because you take once green lush area and you pave it 
and you put glass and stone structures, and then you have metal cars collecting heat. And they call that the urban heat island effect. And that so also... They, that's, that's a well-known studied phenomenon, sure. And we can build things better now with these, with these uh, you know, you, you got to make a mistake to learn from your lesson. And I guess ultimately is, is when are we going to learn from our lesson here? There are some inefficiencies. I'm not totally anti, you know, city, but I do believe that we can design them better. I, I think well, that's why. That's kind of like a, a, a paradigm. We have to design. Yes, sir. Better. Yeah. Everything. Everything. <laughs> you know, cars that's, that's, are not. You know, cars. That's would, the beauty of of being uh, alive. Mm. Is you know every generation has an opportunity. Mm. We have an opportunity to make things worse, or we have an opportunity to make things better. You know, and those are those are choices that we can make as individuals. It's you know holding our elected officials uh, accountable. Yeah. And hold and 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 not forgetting every perhaps <laughs> perhaps as as entities corporate entities you know can be. Um, educated with with more uh, empathy for their what they share the world with you know the rest of us well get this you just brought a, a great yeah so in such a judicious system as we have a corporate body is indeed uh, a, a treated as a human being in many ways it's a citizen given the rights of a citizen, a corporate body, why isn't it tried as a citizen? Why isn't it held accountable as a citizen? Well, that's actually in the works. There, there, it needs to there, happen. There are people arguing for that. And I like what they did in, uh, it was uh, New Zealand. They said, no, this body of land is a citizen. They said, no, this piece of land, you can't build on it. This, this, this is a citizen and it has rights. And I think the more we play their game, and they got the best minds putting this crap together. The more we play their own game and, and, and or beat them at their own game, working with each other and figuring out little loopholes we can figure out to, to outdo theirs, the, the better we're gonna be out, you know, in the long run from this. Hmm. I really do. A few more minutes? Five minutes. Yeah. Um, I have to think on that for a second. Uh, civilization scale problems, uh, they are very big. Yeah. Um, I've, I've shared this little story before and I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, there was an, a show on WOR Channel 9 out of New York called The Joe Franklin Show. You, got, you remember The Joe Franklin Show? I know. And I saw this broadcast one afternoon after school, which really, really gave me the chills. And what he had an archeologist who had just come back from translating um, either, you know, Incan or Mayan or, you know, some South Central American um, stone carvings hmm. and, their, and their hieroglyphs. Right, and this archaeologist was visibly shaken up, visibly shaken up, mm. and and what he was what he was um, elaborating on is that he had just translated and you know understood this document that reported a civilization scale failure. Okay. Of, you know, talk about, you know, massive, like New York City size scale city mm -hmm. having infrastructure failure. A combination of things happened. They had warring nations from the outside. Mm -hmm. And then they had crop failures because of, of a climate change. Right. The rains weren't coming. And when they ran out of vegetable matter, they, read, they had no game to hunt because they were in an urban situation. Right. And within two weeks, there was cannibalism on the street. Sure. 
because of privation and starvation. Mm -hmm. And this archaeologist was like, you, you have to understand the size and scale of our civilization today and all the things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And then when, when things go wrong in a domino Everything's effect. Everything's affected, yeah. Right? In a domino effect. And you have an infrastructure failure where there's not diesel fuel to, you know, yeah, sure. There's, there's food being grown out in the fields, but you can't get it right. to, the, to the population that needs it. Mm -hmm. You know, any number of things can go wrong with our civilization on the scale that it is. Absolutely. And that's, that was the warning that, that these people were giving to future generations is, you know, be careful how you do things. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a civilization fail, it it's, it's gets ugly very quickly. It gets bad very quickly. Yeah. You know, so that's why, that's why, you know, redesigning things and thinking, thinking good thoughts. And, uh, don't eat your neighbor. Don't eat your neighbor. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah, so I guess we can wrap it up now. It's been another hour. We got a minute, and uh, thanks for watching Conan Show, Redo, Redox, and uh, Sam Thrift. Right Thank on, you very George. much. Yeah, oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. engaging good. mind. Good, good to have you on, and you'll oh. come back. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you have a band with you? you? Do you play with a band? Uh, I do. Now we do everything online around the United States. So I have a, a, an ever-growing number of band members now. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm up to like 20 different collaborative artists right now. That's far up. It's really weird. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a <laughs> it's great so tool. weird. I, I, I record right. little tidbits. Of the... So we're going to sign off. All right, thank and, you. Uh, thanks for watching. so much. I um, am very honored to be here today. Unfortunately, I am just a very normal person. Uh, as you will see in my presentation, uh, it will be sometimes difficult, sometimes maybe boring, sometimes dull, but it will be only fact-based. I will show you scientific data from peer-review-based scientific journals, and I will come back today. This very morning, I was so sad to hear on the television news that Danes are not longer the most happy people in the world. Uh, it's actually people from Panama uh, in, in um, the Middle Americas. Uh, but um, I know that you actually are the most happy people. For a Swede, it's always wonderful to come to Denmark, and particularly, I would say, to Copenhagen. You have so much to offer us, and uh, it's lovely to be here. And as uh, you heard before, please do not interrupt. Uh, have a piece of paper and a pen. Take down whatever comments or questions or suggestions you have, and we save them for the general discussion. Also, it's extremely important that you do not, and Maybe I don't even have to say this, uh, because you are really eagles and I'm a small, small sparrow. Uh, but you should not blindly and blue-eyedly trust what I tell you. Uh, do not let your children or your own future depend on this day. Uh, be critical. Uh, bring out the relevant scientific literature. Read for yourself. It's all out there in the public domain. Discuss in between, compare, investigate, think, and think again. And then take a decision uh, based on these facts for yourselves and for your family based on your own convictions. Um, also, I will try to kind of translate the data in the peer-review-based scientific publications 
uh, that all are acknowledged and um, uh, checked by other scientists in the field. And I will try to translate these papers into your own reality. What does it mean for you here in Denmark when scientists in their laboratories demonstrate serious effects in molecules, cells, bacteria, plants, insects, mammals, and in humans from artificial electromagnetic fields? Today, we should discuss something which the Steiner School and the Steiner Daycare Center in the town of Bærum in Norway uh, a few months ago has decided not to welcome in their premises. And I'm talking about the wireless society with all the radiation coming from various gadgets, interconnecting them, making them of course useful, uh, but in a wireless fashion using microwaves and other electromagnetic fields. And this school in Norway, they instead have determined to make their school a wireless free zone. And I just heard before the start that there are at least one such school here in Denmark as well. Today we shall discuss something which the insurance companies around the world, including Lloyd's in the UK and Reassurance in Switzerland, refuse to take responsibility for. Among such items, you do not only find health effects of electromagnetic fields, but also, as you probably already know, health effects of gene-modified organisms, health effects of nanotechnology, and so on. Is it not very strange? They are all sold to us as 100% risk-free and completely safe and then they should be safe to insure. But the insurance companies, very early, I was at a meeting, for instance, in London 2004, they completely refuse to come close to the health effects of the modern electromagnetic society. That is very telling, at least for a scientist and a normal person, and I believe it's also for you. Today we shall discuss something which the telecom manufacturers and operators also completely and totally refuse liability for. Their products are safe, so they claim, but they do not legally touch them even with a barge pole or a pair of pliers. So in a sense, these companies have their own precautionary principle. And oddly enough, it's very often found out that the uh, families of the high-ranking CEOs of these companies, they do not use the gadgets that their father or mother sell to the children and grown-ups in the rest of the world. They stay themselves away from them. Today we should discuss something which the telecom manufacturers, for health safety reasons, tell you to keep at least one inch away from your body. If this is a mobile phone, it should be at least one inch away from your body. And they are also applied for technical patents ba based on cancer risks. And it's very interesting because if you think for a moment, when you buy a wireless gadget such as a mobile phone or a decked telephone or a, a tablet, um, and you should keep it one inch away from your body, you can never, ever touch it. And that means that they have legally secured themselves. If you will get some health effects, like cancer, for instance, you go to a court of law, the first thing the manufacturer's lawyers will ask you, did you hold the mobile phone in your right hand or in your left hand? And you maybe say, oh, I used my right hand. And then they will say, you couldn't you should keep it an inch away from your body. You are smoked. You are screwed as consumers. 